When we think of demonic possession, oftentimes it involves images of Hollywood films. But according to psychiatrist Richard Gallagher, very few cases are actually the real deal. And of those rare few, some of them are so over the top with what takes place, who sees the supernatural manifestations and truly affects all those involved. This case is one of them. This is the untold story of the Amons family haunting, also known as the exorcism of Latoya Amons, or the house of 200 demons. Today's content is brought to you by DraftKings. Looking for an easy way to have some fun without leaving your house? Check out DraftKings Casino, the number one ranked online casino app with over 300 real money games. I'm partnering with DraftKings on this video to let you guys know about an awesome deal that they have going on right now. All new customers who sign up using my promo code Mystery Archives and make a minimum $5 deposit will get that deposit matched dollar for dollar up to $500 in casino credits. With over 175 slot games from you to choose from, including your favorites, and an assortment of DraftKings exclusives, there are many ways to have fun. If casino isn't yet available in your state, check out the DraftKings Daily Fantasy app, where you can win cash prizes all season long. Most importantly, DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable. So sign up today using my promo code MYSTERYARCHIVES and make a $5 minimum deposit and get that deposit matched dollar for dollar, up to $500 in casino credits. Now, let's get back to the content. In November of 2011, Latoya Ammons moved her three small children and her mother, Rosa Campbell, into a new home in a seemingly quiet neighborhood on Carolina Street in Gary, Indiana. The family was ready for a new start and the children couldn't wait to move in. What they would discover is the home of their dreams would turn out to become something more reminiscent of their nightmares. At first, all seemed to be normal and life was going well for the family. It wasn't until December that they began to experience strange and unexplainable happenings. In the dead of winter, Latoya Amons had noticed large swarms of horseflies invading her screened-in front porch. She and her mother would kill them, but every single day they would return in what appeared to be greater numbers. After some time, the flies disappeared, lulling Latoya into a false sense of security and filling her with a feeling of relief. But despite the absence of the flies, the strange happenings would persist. Every night around midnight, when everybody was in bed, they would hear footsteps climbing the basement stairs. In a state of terrified shock, Latoya and her mother would listen as the steps got louder and louder, eventually reaching the top. Once at the top of the stairs, the door from the basement to the kitchen would open, even if the door had been previously locked. But when the unexplained noises were investigated, all that would be found is the basement door open to the pitch black void below. One quiet night, Latoya was awoken by the sound of her closet door opening. As she turned to inspect the source of the disturbance, she saw a tall, shadowy figure emerge from her closet, and then it exited through her door and into the living room. Latoya leapt from her bed and followed the figure, and what she would discover would make her blood run cold. In the living room, she saw a silhouette of a very large man who was pacing back and forth throughout her living room. Who was this man? What did he want? And more importantly, what was he doing in her home? 
Latoya instinctually turned on the light in an attempt to confront the intruder. But to her surprise, the man had disappeared. Scared and confused, Latoya investigated further and what she would find defied all logic. On the floor, in the same spot where the figure had been pacing, were a series of large muddy boot prints. How could something that was conceivably hallucinated have left a physical mark? Was this an entity attempting to convey a message? And if so, what was it trying to say? These manifestations, mysterious and off-putting as they were, did not scare the family. If anything, it just made them generally uneasy. It wasn't until March 10th of 2012 that those feelings would transform into pure, unadulterated horror. On the date in question, Latoya and Campbell were hosting a wake, mourning the loss of a family member, which was attended by a small group of friends and family. The wake had lasted long into the night, and at around 2 a.m. was abruptly interrupted by the sound of screaming. Latoya had been in her mother's room with her 12-year-old daughter and her daughter's friend when suddenly Latoya began screaming for her mother. Rosa sprinted into the room to find her 12-year-old granddaughter unconscious and levitating over the bed. After gathering their bearings, the family and friends surrounded the bed and began to pray. As they prayed, the girl was slowly lowered back down and onto the bed. What is going on, Campbell thought. Why is this happening? When the girl awoke, she had no recollection of what had just taken place. Soon after, the visibly shaken and traumatized visitors left the house and would ultimately refuse to ever return. What began as a place of family and safety had overnight become a place of terror and loneliness. Unsure of where else to turn, Latoya and Rosa called a slew of local churches, but most refused to listen. Eventually, they would get a hold of a church that was willing to hear their story, and once it was heard, the circumstance was undeniable. To the family's shock, officials at the church informed them that what they were dealing with was in fact a demonic occupation of their home. At the recommendation of the church, Latoya and her mother cleaned out the entire home with bleach and ammonia, poured olive oil on the children's hands and feet, and smeared oil in the shape of a cross on their foreheads. Seeking further guidance and expertise, they reached out to two clairvoyants who told them that their home was beset by over 200 demons. The family was instructed that their best course of action would be to move. However, they were strapped for cash and moving was not an option at the time. Instead, Latoya, at the advice of the clairvoyance, made an altar in the basement. The altar consisted of an end table covered in a white sheet and on the sheet was placed a candle and the statues of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. She also covered the walls in the basement in salt, which was believed to add an extra layer of protection from the demonic. Dressed in white clothing, Latoya and a friend conducted a cleansing ritual inside of the house. They burned sage and sulfur, starting upstairs and working their way all the way to the basement, drawing crosses in the smoke in every room. Her friend read Psalm 91 as they proceeded. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. After the ritual was performed, Nothing out of the ordinary happened for about three days. But after those three days passed, the situation became infinitely worse. Latoya started to notice that her children 
were acting strange, for seemingly no reason whatsoever. They began talking in sinister, deep voices, and their smiles became twisted and curled. She also reported that their eyes appeared to bulge. Her children were acting like completely different people. When the children's appearances would return to normal, following these episodes, they would have no recollection of anything ever having been different. Latoya's youngest son would sit in the closet and talk to another boy that nobody could see. The boy would say, I've been here long enough. I came to kill, and I'm going to kill, and spoke with her son so very descriptively about what it was like to be murdered. Once, Latoya's son was thrown from the closet, almost as if he had been tossed, hitting his sister and knocking her into a headboard, which gave her an injury that required stitches. Her daughter would later tell a psychiatrist that sometimes she felt as if she was being held down and choked, unable to speak or move while voices would say to her that she would never see her family again and that she would be dead in 20 minutes. Latoya believed that she and her children were being possessed. Randomly, Latoya's body temperature would rapidly raise and she would begin to shake, falling in and out of consciousness. Rosa, however, never experienced anything demonic or strange towards her. To this, she credits her guardian angel. Some nights, what happened to the family was so severe that Latoya opted for them to spend the night at a hotel. Fearing the worst for her children, Latoya and her mother took the children to see their doctor in April of 2012. Upon entering the exam room, the doctor said he was immediately overtaken by a sense of terror and dread and this was entirely unexplainable. As Latoya told the story of what the family had been experiencing, the doctor was writing down notes that said delusional, delusional ghosts in the home, and hallucinations. Out of nowhere, the youngest son began aggressively cursing at the doctor in a demonic voice. Then, he was lifted high into the air, and thrown into a wall without a single person having touched him. The boy passed out, and at the same time, so did his older brother. Medical staff tried shaking them awake, but they were completely unconscious. Someone working at the doctor's office called 911, and eight police officers, along with paramedics, arrived and took the boys to the hospital. Latoya followed and asked hospital personnel to put olive oil on her sons, to which they simply just laughed in her face. Unable to talk to her children, or even to decide what she would do or where she was going to start, she began to pray. At this moment, their nightmare resumed once again. Both boys awoke. The oldest of the two acted normally, but the youngest began screaming and attempted to attack everybody near him. In total, it would take five grown men to fully restrain him. A hospital employee who believed that the boys were being abused contacted the Department of Child Safety, citing Latoya's seemingly obvious mental illness. DCS sent out family case manager Valerie Washington, who concluded in her report that neither Latoya nor her children were in bad health, or suffered from any bruises, cuts, or burns. The psychiatrist at the hospital also evaluated Latoya and found that she was in fact sane. As Washington interviewed the family, Latoya's youngest son began to growl and his eyes rolled back into his head. He grabbed his brother around the neck, squeezing tightly and refusing to let go until his hands were physically pried from one another. Later that same day, Washington, an RN, 
and the boy's grandmother took them into a small exam room to interview them alone. While in the room, the youngest son began to growl yet again, looking into the eyes of his older brother in a deep, demonic voice. He said it's time, time to, to die, die, and I, I will, will kill, kill you. At this moment, the older brother bent into a running stance and sprinted directly at his grandmother, headbutting her on the stomach as hard as he possibly could, over and over again. Rosa grabbed the boy's hand and said that you are not my grandson. You are a demon. Then something terrifying happened. With that same twisted smile, and look of pure malevolence. He walked backwards towards a wall, and to the shock and awe of everybody, walked backwards up the wall and onto the ceiling, still holding his grandmother's hand the entire time, before flipping off the ceiling and back onto the floor, landing on his feet. After a few moments of stunned silence, Washington and the RN ran out of the room and found the doctor. They explained what they had just witnessed, but the doctor did not believe them, stating that he thought it had to be some sort of trick. The doctor entered the room and requested the boy to do the trick again so that he could see it. The boy replied that he did not remember what had happened and was unable to recreate it. The RN who was far from a skeptic of the demonic, said that he fully believed what was happening to the boys was the product of possession. And the case manager agreed, stating that there was an evil influence affecting the Amon's family. Latoya's youngest son was admitted to the hospital, and she spent the night with him, while Rosa took the two older children to stay with a relative. The next day was the youngest boy's eighth birthday. DCS told Rosa to bring the other children back to the hospital as they could further discuss what had happened. The family celebrated with cake and even sang songs. But once the party was over, Latoya received soul-crushing news. Washington told her that DCS would be taking custody of her children as they believed they were being spiritually and emotionally neglected. The family cried together. They did not want to be separated, and they didn't understand why DCS had come to this decision. But unfortunately, there was nothing that they could do. On the morning of April 20th of 2012, Lotoya would receive some rather unexpected assistance. The hospital chaplain contacted Reverend Maginel the Reverend had never performed an exorcism before, nor had he ever been asked, but he agreed to help as much as he could. Visiting Latoya and Rosa at their home on Carolina Street, he interviewed them. While they spoke, Rosa commented on a flickering light in the bathroom, which stopped each time the Reverend walked over to it. It must be scared of me, he thought. The interview would be interrupted once again when Rosa pointed out that the window blinds in the kitchen kept swinging, even at the absence of an air current in their home. Maginot also said that he saw wet footprints in the living room, and during the interview, Latoya complained of a migraine. The Reverend wondered whether this could be attributed to the demonic activity, so he placed a crucifix on her head. She then began convulsing. After interviewing the two women for four hours, Reverend Maginel was convinced that the family was being tormented by demons and that they had overtaken their home. He blessed the house and told them the house wasn't safe and that they needed to leave immediately. So the two moved in with a relative. A week later, DCS sent Washington to the Carolina Street home to verify whether or not the home was safe for the children to live in. With her, she had a Lake County police officer and two other assisting officers. 
one being the Gary police captain. Latoya refused to go inside, so Rosa took the group into the home to inspect it. In the basement, underneath the stairs, was a dirt patch from which Rosa said that she believed the demons emanated from. The captain said that he believed in ghosts, but not in demons, and would later say that changed after he visited the home on Carolina Street. During the interview with Rosa, multiple electronic devices carried by the officers malfunctioned, even though the batteries had just been replaced. An audio recording taken by one of the officers, when played back, revealed a disembodied voice whispering to them. They also took multiple photos which contained silhouettes, and when enhanced, one even contained a face. At his home, the police captain said that his garage door refused to open, and the driver's seat of his personal vehicle began moving erratically on its own. After it was inspected by a mechanic, it was revealed that the motor that controlled the seat was broken, and that if it malfunctioned while the captain was driving, it could have resulted in a distraction which would have caused a serious accident. Some time would pass before the same group, accompanied by two other officers, as well as DCS case manager Samantha Illick, would return to the home. Illick went in place of Washington, as Washington refused to re-enter the home. As they entered the basement, Illick noticed a strange liquid dripping. When she touched it, she noticed that it felt both slippery and sticky between her fingers. Maginot wanted to check the dirt spot under the stairs for items that may be cursed, as this would offer a solid explanation as to what the family was dealing with. But upon searching, he would find nothing of significance. Maginot blessed some salt and spread it throughout the basement, and the group went back upstairs. While in the living room, Illick began to notice something strange happening. Her pinky finger on her left hand began to tingle and turn white. She complained that her finger suddenly began to feel as if it was broken. Then, out of nowhere, she began to feel as if she was having a panic attack and was unable to breathe. The police captain, who had many times before seen the true horrors of society, refused to stay in the house past dark and requested that the inspection of the house be hurried. Illick and Latoya left the house and the officers continued their investigation. On the main floor of the house, they noticed an oil-like substance dripping from the blinds. Thinking that Latoya or Rosa may have poured oil on them to sell their story, they wiped it up and sealed the room for 25 minutes. To their confusion, the oil had reappeared. Could this have been the same liquid that Illick had encountered in the basement? Upon speaking with Maginot, they were told that the liquid was in fact a manifestation of the demonic. The Reverend would take notes of his findings and requested permission from a bishop to perform an exorcism on Latoya herself, but his request was denied. Instead, the bishop told him to contact priests who have themselves performed exorcisms, but they were no help either. That night, Magino blessed the home in order to cleanse it before proceeding. A minor exorcism would follow, for which he did not need church approval. The ritual consisted of prayers and appeals for the demons to be cast out. The look in the two officers were in attendance. After the ritual had finished, Illick said that something unexplainable was definitely going on, but stopped short of admitting that it was demonic. Regardless, she had chills the entire time, stating that it felt like something was in the room with them and breathing down their necks. Within a week of attending the exorcism, 
She too began to experience problems, but hers were medical in nature. She suffered third degree burns from a motorcycle, broke three ribs jet skiing, and broke her hand as well as her ankle, all within the same month. It is believed that these injuries were a result of her attendance during the ritual performed by the reverend. After the minor exorcism was successful, the bishop would give Maginot permission to conduct a proper exorcism on Latoya. He stated that the ritual was the same as the one he had originally conducted. However, it was stronger because this time he had the backing of the Catholic Church. Before the exorcism was to be performed, Maginot tasked Latoya with researching the names of the demons that were tormenting her. During the research, Latoya complained of a physical illness and that her computer kept forcibly shutting itself down. After some time, she was able to locate the names of the demons who she believed were causing her and her family so much trouble. One of them was Beelzebub, the Lord of Flies. Others were demons that she found which specifically torture and harm children. Maginot would go on to perform three exorcisms on Latoya at his church. The first two were conducted in English, and the last was in Latin. During these exorcisms, Maginot pressed a crucifix to her head and chanted, I cast you out, unclean spirit, along with every satanic power of the enemy, every specter from hell, and all of your companions, in the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ. Each time, his voice became louder and more forceful, which worked in weakening the demons. Latoya convulsed violently, showing off the demon's true strength to Magino. During this time, Latoya prayed with him until it became too physically painful for her to continue. She equated the pain that she was feeling to the pain of childbirth, but stated that the pain was nowhere near natural. Eventually, Latoya fell asleep and the ritual had ended. And between the second and third exorcism, which were conducted several weeks apart, a woman who had helped with the rituals was tasked with setting up a backup plan in case Latoya had issues. The woman who wrote the name of a demon on a piece of paper put it in an envelope and surrounded it with salt that had been blessed. If Latoya had problems, the woman was to burn the envelope containing the name of the demon. Within that time, Latoya and her mother had moved into a new home in Indianapolis, a home which Maginot had previously blessed. One night, as a storm raged outside, Latoya would call Maginot complaining that she was having horrifically bad nightmares pertaining to demons. So, the woman was instructed to burn the envelope and after this, the nightmares would cease. Time would pass, and new tenants would eventually occupy the home on Carolina Street, and the landlord would say that since the incidents involving the Amons family, no other paranormal activity had been reported at the residence. Latoya would eventually regain custody of her children in November of 2012, and DCS would regularly check up on them until January of 2013, when they would ultimately close their case. They noted that there were no demonic presences reported at their home in Indianapolis, and that her children felt much safer within its walls. Amons thanked God for guiding them through, and the family would go on to live happily and quietly without any semblance of demonic intervention. So, if we accept at face value those who witness these bizarre and demonic manifestations, we must ask just what could have caused the haunting or the summoning of the entities. 
Did LaToya mess with something that she shouldn't have? Was it something indeed invoked within the property itself at some point? Or could it have been generational? It's hard to tell, but what is incredible is that nurses, officers, and other officials of the state bore witness to these happenings. Although not descriptive as some of my other videos, the information at times is scarce, so I did the best I could to piece everything together. It is believed that the other 199 demons were under or serving Beelzebub, which certainly made himself present with the swarms of flies in the depths of winter. Ultimately, I am glad that this family was able to free themselves from the ensnaring trap of the devil and his minions. Not everyone is so lucky, and in due time, we'll cover cases that reflect that. So my advice, if you enter a home, let alone live there, and feel as if eyes are boring a hole into the back of your head, and you feel scared for no reason, trust your gut, because ultimately, it could end up saving your very soul. Thank you all so much for watching this brand new video. I will be doing a giveaway following this video of a signed Mystery Archives poster. All you have to do is comment, like, and share this video to enter. All these things truly help me out in the algorithm, and they keep me seen by new people. Also, a big thanks to DraftKings for yet again helping to support the channel. And other than that, guys, I hope all of you have an incredible fall, make the changes you need to make, and continue to chase a happy and successful life. And until next time, this has been Cody here at Mystery Archives. Remember to please stay safe out there and take care.